Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where each week I invite a panel of business experts to go over the morning newspapers, discuss what's going on in their own individual businesses and their own individual business sectors, and finally, what's caught their eye in this week's panel. Today, we, today we've got a fantastic panel of guests, but before I introduce them, I would just like to say a big thank you to our sponsors, Hazelwood Accountants and Business Advisors. They're absolutely brilliant that they're sponsoring us and they make great coffee. Anyway, so let me introduce you to the guests. We've got Chris Pocket, Head of Communications at Renishaw. Chris has seem, seemed to have been at Renishaw forever and a day. Uh, he's uh, Gloucester, uh, Renishaw is Gloucester's biggest company with turnover of 566 million, 2,500 staff here in Gloucestershire over across four sites and employ globally 5,000. So welcome, Chris. We've got Enzo Mora, Managing Director of the Mortgage Brain. He's got 100 staff, just moved offices, turnover of 4.5 million. We've got Richard Jones, Managing Director of JEC Electrical. He's got seven staff, turnover just over a half a million. He is electric car charging guru. It's great to be have him on the show as well, as well as Enzo. And finally, last not least, will be Talifa Nelson, CEO of Gloucestershire Community Trust. If, if, oh, we can get her connected and hopefully she'll be joining us very, very shortly. Uh, before we start, I'd like to just say, if you like the show, please uh, like, share and subscribe. I'm just going to go over and share the headlines. So let's see if we share the screen, courtesy of the BBC. So let's go through the headline. The Daily Telegraph, Johnson buckles over party inquiry. The Metro, the gig is up, Boris. The Times, PM bows to new parties inquiry over Tory revolt. The I, Tory rebels force official inquiry into Johnson. The Guardian, MP backs lies inquiry on the day of humiliation for the PM. The Daily Mail, how long can the party go fast go on? The Mirror, at last, Tories turn on the PM. The Financial Times, number 10 and threatens to shed Brexit trade deal with new Northern Ireland bill. bill. Do you think that's a dead cat on the kitchen table moment as they try and deflect away from the uh, party gate? The Sun, home sweet home. That's the story about Ronaldo and new treasure trove of clues and cancer fights as the Daily Express and the Daily Star, my number one heading today, calm down dears, war of the Wazaks. And <laughs> that is uh, obviously Trump Piers and uh, and um, and Farage all having a little spat together. Don't you just love the Daily Star? Anyway, Tully, welcome to Letha. Hopefully, you can turn on your mic as well, and we will go straight in with Chris. Uh, Chris, what have you chosen from the papers, please? Okay, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going with a story from Times, slightly different um, story. Um, relating to Ukraine, uh, obviously it's uh, you know with terrible news pretty much every day coming out of uh, of the Ukraine. Um, but I've gone with some a slightly different take here. So um, the headline is: Refugee children are more than equal to Europe's mass tests. So this is um, ten thousand Ukrainian children now enrolled in French schools, and sixteen thousand Ukrainian child refugees in Italian schools. And basically, the, the feedback from both France and Italy from, from teachers in the relevant schools is that uh, the Ukrainian students are basically one year ahead of in ability with their, compared to their peer groups, which is quite interesting. And they put it down to a number of factors, including traditional teaching and textbooks that um, you know, date back many years and, in fact, teaching methods that are similar to those which were seen by our parents in the 1940s. But I think it's you know it's quite a, an interesting take and, and perhaps a positive on on what is a, a very pretty tragic story. And they're probably around four or five years ahead of our own kids. I that's my, that's my take. Less, on it. No, you may think that I obviously <laughs> are my clearly my children are, are at a good level, but um, okay. Uh, what else? Local you? schools, of course, uh, in Gloucestershire are excellent. Mark, I think we need to balance that. So I'm not sure we we necessarily can go with that that view. <laughs> Go on then, mate. What else have you picked up? Have you got another story? 
Yeah, I've got one more story. Uh, it's quite an interesting one. You, you know, I've been on a couple of times before. I like uh, history. Don't worry, I'm not going to do my eight minute Titanic story this time. Um, but this is uh, actually going back to the Anglo Saxon period. So going back to sort of the fifth and to 11th centuries. Um, and some research has been carried out by uh, Cambridge uh, University looking at the diets of people from that period. So they did some. Uh, bone analysis of uh, over 2,000 people um, from that from uh, 5th to 11th centuries. They were looking at basically chemical signatures for what people ate and looked at their diets. And despite all the evidence that we often see, and they, they cited some of that, um, the, those cases or sort of documents that show these huge shopping lists effectively for, for banquets. Um, and there's one here from the King Ina or Ine Ina of Wessex um, from the 7th century, which lists um, uh, uh, asking local farmers to supply 10 vats of honey, 300 loaves, 42 buckets of beer. Sounds like your sort of average barbecue, Mark, doesn't it? Um, two full grown cattle or 10 sheep, 10 geese, 20 hens, 10 cheeses, a bucket of butter, five salmon, and 100 eels. Um, but despite that, um, what uh, their research suggests from, from the bone analysis, and they, they could look at sort of strata of society based on the grave goods that were with those, those people that have been buried, um, was actually that most people had more what we term the sort of flexitarian type um, diet, and actually they had a lot more vegetables than you'd imagine. And in fact, a lot of these shopping lists and these evidence of these huge feasts actually relate to more special events like massive barbecues when the communities all came together, so three, 400 people sharing in, in that food. Still about 4,000 calories they calculate per person, um, probably have to do a lot of running to get that off. But um, that, I thought that was, that was quite an, an, an interesting piece. And as one of the historians that was involved with this uh, project says, I've been to plenty of barbecues where friends have cooked ludicrous amounts of meat, so we shouldn't be too surprised. No, no, absolutely fascinating. Thanks ever so much for that, Chris. Okay, we're going to go over to Tele Talitha. Hi there, thanks for joining us, Talitha, this morning. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You're very blurry. Sorry, my screen quality is so bad. It's not about 20 years off me, but for some reason, my Zoom is not working very don't well. Don't worry, don't worry at all. It's always, <laughs> a, it's always a pleasure to it's see you. It's a very you. strange screen. But anyway, um, it's been an interesting week. I mean, obviously... <sighs> Ukraine is really dominating the news and it's something that is quite distressing when you're reading it every day. Um, it's interesting conversations, uh, just how we think things are going to pan out. I'm slightly concerned the amount of big aeroplanes going over my house first thing this morning. I live fairly on the Bryce Norton um, path and it's just so worrying um, what's going on. So I find it quite hard not to look at anything else at the moment, but as it's already been covered, there's a couple of things that have popped up and I think quite poignant and, and maybe seem um, less important, but actually it is really important, often um, very much kept um, behind closed doors. And it's Christian and Ronaldo's lost one of his children. And it is so sad when you're lose, losing a child through birth, the amount of people that have suffered miscarriage or loss of a child um, that haven't been supported to have been, it's gone unnoticed it's it's very silent um it's actually positive in the sense that it's being talked about and he's getting support um it's one of those things that is always very difficult to talk about very difficult to share but actually um the other side and there's a really interesting discussion about privilege and just because you're privileged it doesn't seem to affect you as much. Um, I won't say who it was, but there's a discussion at the moment about a an editor of a newspaper who dismissed um, somebody's loss of a child because they were from a privileged background. It was one of our previous prime ministers and the loss of his child. It's such a sensitive topic. I'm pleased that it's being discussed, um, but we must remember no matter how privileged people are, um, these are very, very painful moments. So losing a child um, 
interesting that it's in the news and it's being discussed and it's being discussed sensitively. So I'm very pleased about that. There are charities in our county that deal with grief um, and deal with loss and the charities that support people in our county are some of the few support networks that people are going to have when they go through such tragic times. So I find that um, quite a poignant one to, to look at and, and, to, and to think about and the amount of people that come forward who have experienced loss. Okay, thanks ever so much for that, Talitha. Totally agree with you. That brings us uh, on to Enzo, because I know that you were going to bring that up, Enzo, uh, and about the sporting elements of it and, and what happened during the game. Yeah, so um, that, that, that was going to be my first story today, um, Ronaldo and the loss of his child. But as a huge Liverpool fan, uh, it was a big week this week where Liverpool entertained Man United in a Premier League match. And um, the crowd took it upon themselves after seven minutes, uh, seven being the number that Ronaldo uh, wears on his shirt. Uh, and the whole crowd applauded uh, in that seventh minute and um, went on to sing You'll Never Walk Alone, which is a, a famous uh, Liverpool FC uh, crowd song. Um, so rivalries were put aside, you know, for that moment. And uh, it was really nice to see that. Yeah, because, you know, it goes to show that sports, you know, crosses over. It doesn't matter who you support. We're all in it together at the end of the day, isn't it? It's a bit like yeah. what's happening with the Ukrainian um, football players. Uh, you know, the support they've been given uh, been quite tremendous as well. What else have you picked out then, Enzo? Uh, well, continuing with the sporting thing uh, somewhat and uh, regarding the war. So it's about Wimbledon and the All England Lawn Tennis Club. Uh, not sitting on the fence and deciding to uh, ban all uh, Russian and Belarus uh, players from this year's tournament. Um, and the, the Russians, uh, number two, well, the world number two uh, men's uh, player is uh, Medvedev, a Russian, so he won't be playing at Wimbledon this year. And uh, there was a number of other uh, top seeds, male and female, that won't be attending. Uh, and that uh, decision goes against the, the the World Association Association of Tennis Professionals uh, ruling that um, they could play in events under a neutral flag. Do you agree with that? Under a neutral flag? No, no. The fact that they, they banned them and said no, you can't play. Um, I'm not sure I do. Um, but it is a bold move. Uh, it, it only it was only decided yesterday, so. Um, I, I take a bit of time to uh, digest information. So right now I, I disagree with it, but I'm not sure if my opinion will change over the coming days. Okay, I'm going to ask the rest of the panel actually. Chris, is it right that uh, Wimbledon's banned the Russian player? Same as you, Talifa, same as you, Richard. Let's just go, yes or no, sir? Yes. Yes, is Richard? Chris? I, 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 I think so, but I, I all have, it's really difficult this because you know, Renishaw is basically closing its operations in, in Russia. And obviously we've got colleagues that are losing their jobs or have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And, and I think it's a really, it's a complex one. It's, um, but I, I think given the, the, the sort of prominence that, that sports stars have, I think on balance, I, I, I agree that um, it's, it's, a, it's a bold move, but I agree with it. Talitha? I probably would agree. I think sanctions are one of the few things we've got we've got to put pressure on. I mean, uh, yes, it's unfortunate, but I would probably agree. Okay, thanks ever so much. Well, anyway, let's give Richard a chance. Hi, Richard. Thanks for joining Punchline Talks. Always great to see you, mate. Um, what have you picked <clears throat> up for the papers? Just pick the one story from the Times that interests me. Um, Elon Musk, um, uh, a legend and a genius. Um, but a bit off the wall sometimes. So he's raising $46 billion to buy Twitter, um, which is a lot, but he's putting together a team to buy Twitter, but he's also putting in about $21 billion of his own money, which is also a lot. Um, you know, I think it's amazing what he's done and he hasn't really made a mistake yet. He's come really close to losing it or everything. He gambles everything to do his dreams, but... I don't really know where he's going with this one. 
um, a lot, but unless it's just a whimsy, but whatever it's going to be um, with him, I think it's going to be entertaining. But it, it sort of links into a story that, again, in the Times that I picked up on yesterday. Um, so that $21 billion, I mean, he's already the richest, world's richest man, but yesterday his wealth increased. It's about to balloon by another $23 billion. And he's going to get that because Elon Musk doesn't take a salary from Tesla, but he gets it in shares. So Tesla's um, turnover was up by 81%. Record results, Tesla's was, uh, were up by 81% revenue and the highest profits in the first quarter. So basically it's now worth more than a trillion dollars. So I'm obviously fascinated by this subject. And for the last few years, everyone's been saying, oh, Tesla have been leading the way, but as soon as the big boys come in, your VWs, your BMWs, your Mercedes, then they'll just take over and off they go. But it isn't happening. If anything, Tesla's getting farther away. I mean, they just opened two new gigafactories, as they call them, in Berlin and Texas. And I don't see anyone else coming in anytime soon. And you've, you've got a Tesla. You rocked up here the other day, picking up some magazines uh, yeah. in your Tesla. And you absolutely love them. This, uh once you're in one, we'll have to take a spin one day, Mark. Once you're in one, when you go into an, another car, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. And at the moment, if you want to go electric, if you can, because there's lots of other ones on the market, appreciate that, you know, but it's just the best car, in my opinion, the best car on the road because of the charging network, the technology, because he's a software man. Te um, Elon Musk, a software man. But he's learned to build cars, which is why they had a lot of trouble earlier on. But he's predominantly, they are predominantly a software company, and the software is amazing, incredible. Okay, so, right. Thanks ever so much for that, Richard. Yeah, totally agree. Lo love him. Hey, Chris, let's go back over to you then, please. Let's talk about Renishaw. You you touched on it before, actually, about uh, closing the site in Moscow. That must be quite a difficult decision to make. Well, we acted really quickly. I mean, it, it wasn't that difficult a decision ultimately. Um, the, the day, pretty much the day after the war broke out, we we, we ceased to to supply Russia, and um, it's about one percent of our turnover. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a huge hit, but it's not insignificant. Um, but it was the right, it was the right decision. We were clear on that, and uh, yeah, we're basically winding down the operations in in Russia. As I say, unfortunately, colleagues have lost their jobs, and we've we tried to to relocate some um, staff where it's possible uh, around the rest of the Renshaw group, uh, some very talented individuals, but it is an um, unfortunate consequence of, of the situation. Um, but I think it was um, just untenable really uh, to continue to, to trade um, with, with Russia um, given, this, given all the circumstances. Um, how many, how so, many staff are, are we talking about, Chris? Oh, it was, it, I think it was it was around twenty something. Um, it's not a huge number. Somewhere between twenty and thirty. I'm sorry, I don't have. <laughs> I'm usually very hot on the numbers, but it, it's um, uh, it's it's between it was between twenty and thirty. We had two offices: one in Moscow, one in Perm in the Urals. Okay, uh, let's move on to a positive piece then. We, we ran a story yesterday, it was, was fascinating me, it was about Louise, uh, do I say this right, Callahan, who's the, Callan, new, Callanan. Callanan, who's the new director Callanan. of, of uh, uh, ad, 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 additive manufacturing. What, what exactly is that? Yeah, so additive manufacturing really is the industrial term for 3D printing. So Renishaw is uh, one of the world leaders in... Um, metal 3D printing, so enables manufacturers around the world to make parts um, layer by layer from uh, metal powder. So you start with metal powder and basically you fuse hundreds, if not thousands of layers of um, powder together to, to create a, a solid 3D object. And it's um, incredibly flexible manufacturing technology, which enables you to make some amazing parts because you build layer by layer so you, you can make things with very intricate structures um, with less metal required than you would have with a traditional um, machining process where you start with a block of metal and machine away what you don't want to leave what you do. But this, you only build structure where you need it. So we've been involved with, um, we've, we've basically highlighted the abilities of the technology with some pretty high profile things over recent times, as you're aware, and I know you ran this story, that Renishaw made the 
handlebars for the uh, British um, Olympic uh, track team um, for the Tokyo Olympics. So that was uh, that made that was a great deal of pride around the company. Um, you know, we won uh, as a nation seven seven medals um, and enabled. Uh, Jason and Laura Kenny to become respectively the most successful Olympians of, of all time. Um, so yeah, that was made um, at our HQ near Wotton and Dredge, uh, the, the handlebars uh, for, for the track bike. So it's a fantastic technology. It's, um, it's finding its way into all sorts of different applications. Medical is a, is, a big, um, is a big application for the technology because you can make things bespoke. You don't need to have tooling to start with so you can it's it's possible to have mass what's called mass customization so you can make many many different things in in one batch of build so it's it's fantastic for medical parts because we're all different so whether that be replacement teeth or hip hip replacement hip joints whatever it may well be it's um it's a fascinating technology and it but it sits alongside existing technologies where most of our business still is uh, traditional machines where um, the, the bulk of our business still is, but it's got fantastic potential uh, for lots of different applications. And, and Louise has um, very deservedly been made director of that uh, particular part of our business. And, and not being funny here, it's it's unusual to see a, a woman actually, you know, not because they don't deserve it, because there isn't the volume of, of female manufacturing experts within the sector. No, it's increasing, um, but you're right. Um, there aren't enough role models, and I think that that's really important. It's something we've been pushing a lot at Renishaw uh, over many, many years. So we do an awful lot in schools to try and rebalance this, and it's all about positively promoting female role models. So although um, I think something like 40% of our STEM ambassadors um, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics ambassadors who go into schools and help support our efforts, whether that's in schools or when schools visit our dedicated education centres in South Wales and Gloucestershire, that they actually see a lot of female um, ambassadors. So having those role models is really, really important um, so they can actually relate to somebody like me, uh, because it's very, very difficult if you're faced with a, a sea of male faces. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really positive thing, but very well. brilliant. I was going to say, and that, that leads us ever so nicely as a, a natural link to a role model, and that's Talitha herself. <laughs> a big right. interest. Thank you, Mark. I just uh, wanted I, to make a shout out to Enzo, actually, because I've actually used the mortgage brain and it's absolutely brilliant. And I've never met you in person. I've used Barry and Barry is brilliant. Um, he is and, a great uh, lad. He's amazing, I have to say. So thank you, because uh, the mortgage brain's brilliant. Um, sorry, Mark, but I had to do a shout out because uh, brilliant local business. OK, then, well, let's just just quickly talk about the Gloucestershire Community Foundation, because I've got it down here. The community manages 50 funds, provides grants to over 340 community groups, awarding £2.2 .2 million. Pounds. So what's the sector at the moment? We talked during the pandemic a lot. There was, you know, you were really, really worried about charities going under the, the money. I would imagine it's the cost of living crisis now that you're seeing, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Is that the big thing now? It's just a roller coaster out there. I mean, we hit the pandemic um, and we responded um, very, very quickly. We were donating and delivering grants by the end of March, every seven days we're turning around um, monies to charities who are delivering frontline services. And at that time, we were the only ones doing that, um, and uh, which a community foundation is well set up to do. So we're very good at dealing with emergencies. Um, other monies did trickle through um, at various times throughout that year, but um, it, we were a lifeline at the time. We had a, an ambitious target of raising 50,000. We raised uh, one and a half million. So um, that gives you an idea of just the amount of people that wanted to support businesses, individuals, the NET National Emergencies Trust. Um, and then we went on to thinking, how are charities going to survive um, the following year? So as COVID funds start dwindling, start running out, reserves start getting tight how are they going to um cope and that's the bit we're in now so as you go through things like seasonal surviving winter 
where it's deciding between eating and heating something quite seasonal this issue now is going to be an all year round issue you know people are now struggling to pay for heating and the choice between eating and heating is becoming um, not just a winter issue we're seeing need going tripling quadrupling and all of our charities that deliver these sorts of resources so it's going to be a really tough year because COVID funds are disappearing or disappeared. Charities are now having to raise money and the bucket shaking has been very challenging. Um, raising money has been very challenging. Uh, and so this year is going to be particularly tight. And what was pretty worrying for us, our first grants round this year, we had a £300,000 ask, 40 charities. That's double what we usually get through. And we managed to fund... £85,000. So there's a huge shortfall in the amount of money that's needed out there. So um, that was very worrying for us. Um, where are those charities going to get that money from? I don't know. But if we think about civil society and what charities do, it's not just a nice to have. They are absolutely vital in supporting our county. And without charities, so many people would fall through the gaps. Statutory provision just doesn't hit everybody. It can't. We can't expect it to. And charities step up and fill the gaps. Um, so hopefully our county is a very, very rich county in some aspects, but it's cheap by jowl. And we have some of the poorest people in our county and some of the most areas of deprivation. And, and we hope with the work that we do, we just did a, a fantastic um, piece with the LEP about bringing sectors together. And it's good for businesses to work with charities. So we hope more of that happens this year. Okay, thanks ever so much, Talitha. You do an amazing job, uh, especially over the pandemic as well. Thank so, you. Thanks, thanks for coming on to the show. Enzo, I mean, after that, you got a bit of a drum roll, which is always nice to, to hear someone talking about your, 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 your business. Tell us about the mortgage brain. How long has the, the, the company been going and uh, the, the general gist of it? So... Um... The mortgage, bank, the mortgage brain started trading in 2001 and um, uh, we are now one of the largest independent mortgage brokers in the country. Um, we uh, look after existing customers and new customers. Uh, a lot of our new customer business comes from the national developers that we work with and uh, the new build homes that they're building. Um, and we work across the country. Um, Pleasing to, to now say that we, we do a fair bit of work in Gloucester. Um, there's a large development at Twigworth where a number of national developers are, are building properties. And we're looking after the uh, finances for customers buying those properties and guiding them through that uh, uh, home buying process. And how's the market been? Because we've all, we've all heard and read stories about the housing market overheating costs of going through the roofs roof to buy a house first time buyers can't afford to get on the mortgage market is it slowing down is there any sight of it slowing down you you would think so with all the publicity that we're hearing about house you know house prices being higher than ever uh, and it being harder now to uh, afford a mortgage but it's not slowed down um we had a, a huge upturn during the uh, covid period um and then the, the government offered the stamp duty uh, hiatus uh, for just over a year. So there's a, there was a lot of activity during 2020 and 21, and that's continued through into uh, 2022. God. So uh, long may it continue, but you, you do feel that at some point there, there might be a, a, a slowdown or a correction, but we're not seeing it yet. I mean, the business has just rocketed forward and, and you seem to have come from nowhere, if you don't mind me saying, as a, as a, as a company. And, um, uh, and you're doing extremely well. What, what do you reckon is the secret to the success of the mortgage brain? Um, well, I don't feel like we uh, haven't been around forever because, uh, uh, you know, it's been a long journey. Uh, I started in financial services back in 1988 and then moved uh, predominantly into mortgages in the late 90s, working with local estate agents. And uh, we've got a, a you know, a, a, a huge customer base in Gloucestershire that we look after. Uh, pleasing to hear Talifa say how, how great the service was from Barry, one of our guys. Um, so we put a lot of effort into ensuring that we look after our customers. 
uh, and guide them through that process. So uh, reputation uh, and service has seen us through those years. Okay, and I've thanks. recommended you quite a few times, so I'm sure word of mouth is very powerful. It is, yeah, and we, we certainly welcome that, and thank you very much. Okay, thanks ever so much, and that leads us very nicely onto, uh, onto Richard. He's uh, got a fantastic reputation in, in, in electrical charging points. And I mean, that, this is a fantastic opportunity, isn't it, Richard? The, the, the sales of electric cars are rocketing, you know, rocketing at the moment. You've got to plug the car in somewhere uh, and hopefully you're picking up that business. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's happening. It's going from strength to strength and the market's evolving as the, as, as the amount of cars that come on the market. By the way, while we're on it, I've just gone with mortgage, mortgage brain. So I've just had a mortgage, so shout out while well, I'm doing it. It was shout a bloody big Ryan. love fest between you all. Ryan and Shante, <laughs> they did a great job. It was tricky, but they did a great job. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's what's happening now, it's, it's I've been on this for a few years now, and I've, I knew this was going to come, as I said in your article a few years ago, we did for you, I knew this was coming, and it's here. It's really starting now, even with the pandemic and everything that's going on these cars are coming and it's a revolution in lots of ways. So um, one of the big things I wanted to just talk about, which might not, people might not know too much about them. Why would they? It, it's just a socket, but these things are replacing fuel pumps and the whole, the whole, we don't realize how controlled we are by fuel pumps and stuff like that's part of our normal week and our working life. So these things, but these things need back office in a commercial setting, these back office. So I've been working with a lot of, um, companies for years historically it's been the manufacturers who had their own back office and they would control your charge points look after them so you have a desktop you can add users you can if you want to take a payment from your users open them up to the public if you want but there are a lot of new companies coming in the last few years software companies and they're really shaking things up and like we we saw, we joined up with a company yesterday who are unbelievable what they can do and what they are doing because they're they're looking at seeing how people are going to use these things. So I'll give you an example, um, a company director or a, someone with the company vehicle. So, yeah, the company puts charge points at home, at work. Um, yeah, and he can he would historically get a fuel card and get his petrol paid for. Um, so it worked. Now, with electrons, it's a bit difficult. So if you have a workplace charge point, yeah, the company can pay for that. But what about when you're charging at home or out in the back? So they've got a technology, they develop what they call a digital wallet. So basically it means you, we take over your home charge point or you take over your home charge point and then you operate it with the same app that the company use and automatically that gets charged to the company. Uh, which I think is really cool and it's, a, it's a, Ooh, an imaginative way clever. of, yeah. It's a, it, so at the moment you can still do it because you, you'll have the software so you put a claim in once a month, but it's hassle. So this is just automatic, just goes straight from the company. And the same if you're out and about, like sales reps or whoever travels around the country, they've teamed up with a lot of the big national charging points, Osprey and a few other ones. And you can use lots of different um, companies' charge points with the same app. Because a lot of the problem we've had and are having with the, the and this is the big, this is the big stumbling block with EV take up is the national network. Um, a lot of them, you've got to have different apps for this, different apps for that. This simplifies that. And again, it comes straight from the company. And another technology they're using, which is coming in on that same point, like we've done charge points in garden centres and places like that. We did Slimbridge Wildfire Trust recently, a school in Cheltenham and anywhere where there's cars effectively. And yeah, you add your own users for your own staff or your visitors, but this company, can you can do it with Apple Pay. So you literally wow. just stick a QR code on it, grab your phone, bang, done. No, no app, no nothing. And also you put your charge points. If you want people to come, like the garden centre, what we did in the Cotswolds, they're on the public network. They're on what we call Zap Map, which is the biggest one where all the charge points in the country are there. They lie, they show them, they show what they are, how much they charge, if they're free, which I recommend for business you want to attract customers. And they just, oh, I'm, I'm in that area. I'll go to that garden centre. It's got free charging. So you rock up, you do the app, on that Apple Pay, it doesn't cost them anything because it's free, but if it did, it would automatically take the money. So what's happening and will happen, it's almost with your imagination because we're changing. Like I said before, we don't realise how controlled we are by 
connecting to these nasty fueling pumps and it, it sort of controls your lives but it's changing yeah so that's basically yeah, i think i think it's it fascinating is. whenever i've talked to you rich like it's just a layer and layer and layer <laughs> and uh, and you know what it starts off a five minute conversation it quite easily goes to a 15 20 minute conversation because there's so many different facets to it really and then what i love about it is that your enthusiasm and your knowledge of it because you, you, you start off being an electrician so you've got that sort of technical background isn't it that's behind the company as well. Unfortunately, we have run out of time and we're, we're, we're a little bit over, so I'm going to have to stop it there. Guys, I just want to quickly go over your stories that you picked out for Punchline, please. So let's, Chris, let's go with you. We've got to wrap it up very quickly. What have you picked out for this week's Punch, please? So um, today is World Earth Day. Um, oh. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's good that we're all talking no, it's good. about it's, it. It's good that there is World Earth Day. Um, so I picked up on a link story, I guess, really. Uh, the Stroud business uh, went in Rome. And I'm sorry, Talitha, if that's what you're going to go with as well. No, it wasn't. It's fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> but so they launched the world's first paper wine bottle. So fantastic to see innovation right here in the heart of the county. Um, just saying, obviously, as you well know, Mark, it's, it's in punchline, or should know, combines the eco advantages of bag in the box wine with a ceremony of a traditional bottle. Uh, it's made from 94% recycled paperboard, fully recyclable, um, and has a climate impact around six times smaller than a single use glass bottle. So, really positive story on World Earth Day from right here in the county. Totally loved it. I love the shape of the, the shape of them as well, like a bottle. Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Tanifa, was that one of the stories you picked out? Well, um, it was, but it was it's around obviously Earth Day today. Um, but it was about eBay because I'm a huge eBay fan. I made a pledge not to buy anything new, and I've done that for two years now, and I buy everything secondhand, and my husband doesn't notice. I slip things into his cupboard and he thinks they're new. Um, but we've having come from the retail business and having been a retailer all my life, um, I I feel the impact. So eBay has made, um, uh, has launched today uh, Imperfects range. And it's really good. The amount of waste in this industry is utterly frightening. Um, and the changes in countries across the globe where there's been production and they've lost their rivers, their oceans, their whole land has dried up. Um, so eBay has launched the Imperfects range. So basically it's not going to landfill and I just think eBay's amazing just buying secondhand where we can has been brilliant we haven't noticed nobody's noticed I get told all the time how nice my clothes look and I'm very proud to say they're secondhand so um, well done to eBay and it's brilliant we're talking about Earth Day. Thanks very much. I'd just like to say by the way this shirt I bought in Ledbury £2.50 from a charity shop. Good Mark well done it looks very smart. Thank you very much. I've only had it nine years. OK, and moving on to Enzo. Enzo, what have you picked out from this week's punchline, please? Uh, incredibly, uh, Chris, I've uh, picked the When in Rome story as well. And um, the Strove based craft wine specialist being the first to launch the uh, paper wine bottle. Uh, but it, it made me think I didn't realise we had a problem with uh, glass. I thought glass was recyclable, but so I did a little bit of research and um, the reasons why uh, we'll benefit from paper wine bottles is it's five times lighter and easier to transport. Uh, it's much more easier to recycle uh, than glass and uh, its carbon footprint is six times uh, lower than glass. So Amazing. Uh, if we're all promoting when in Rome, I'm just wondering whether we might be able to get some free samples to try out <laughs> and report back on. <laughs> Well, I think I think I'll, I'll be hot on the tail to very very shortly. Get him on the show, uh, <laughs> Richard. What have you picked out from this week's punchline? Just to your article with Market Group, they're investing seven hundred and fifty thousand in green tech. Um, so great company. I'm pleased to say I'm associated with them, and someone did some lovely charge points there. Um, we did that, um, but just want to shout out to that company because they're leading where others will follow. So they, a few years ago, they put a massive biomass boiler in in two thousand and twelve. Um, so they're now carbon neutral. They don't have any waste. Talking about the environment. Um, they just put 10 charge points in. They're going to, to put another maybe level 20. And they're about to press the button on putting a gigawatt of solar on the roof. It's a thousand kilowatts on the roof. So they're going to be so they're going to save a lot in the pocket and they're going to help the planet. 
Okay, thanks ever so much, Richard. Uh, and um, the stories that caught my eye really was Hercules Site Services invested another 4.5 million. Uh, I did like the story about the wine bottle as well, but the one that really caught my eye this week was actually, I don't want to get political, but it was Mark Harper, the MP for the Forest of Dean, sticking to his convictions and calling for Boris Johnson to go. He was the only one who had the bottle, boom, boom, to do it. Maybe it was a paper bottle that he had, but who knows? But fair play to him. Uh, whatever your politics, that's what I thought. If you enjoy the show, please like, share, and subscribe. I'd like to thank my fantastic panel of guests today for joining us and, uh, and also our sponsors, Hazelwoods. Hopefully you'll join us next week. Thanks for watching Punchline Talks. Cheerio. Bye. <laughs>